Chapter Nine of Stories in Gray. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stories in Gray by Barry Payne. Rose, Rose. Sefton stepped back from his picture. Rest now, please, he said. Miss Rose Rose, his model, threw the striped blanket around her, stepped down from the throne, and crossed the studio. She seated herself on the floor near the big stove. For a few moments Sefton stood motionless, looking critically at his work, and then he laid down his palette and brushes, and began to roll a cigarette. He was a man of forty, thick-set, round-faced, with a reddish moustache turned fiercely upwards. He flung himself down in an easy chair and smoked in silence till silence seemed ungracious. Well, he said, I've got the place hot enough for you today, Miss Rose. You have indeed, said Miss Rose. I bet it's nearer eighty than seventy. The cigarette smoke made a blue haze in the hot, heavy air. He watched it undulating, curving, melting. As he watched it, Miss Rose continued her observations. The trouble with these studios was the draughts. With a strong east wind, same as yesterday, you might have the stove red-hot and yet never get the place, so to speak, warm. It is possible to talk commonly without talking like a coster, and Miss Rose achieved it. She did not always neglect the aspirate. She never quite substituted the third vowel for the first. She rather enjoyed long words. She was beautiful from the crown of her head to the sole of her foot, and few models have good feet. Every pose she took was graceful. She was the daughter of a model, and had been herself a model from childhood. In consequence, she knew her work well and did it well. On one occasion, when sitting for the great Marian, she had kept the same pose without a rest for three consecutive hours. She was proud of that. Naturally, she stood in the first rank among models, and was most in demand, and made the most money. Her fault was that she was slightly capricious. You could not absolutely depend on her. On a wintry morning, when every hour of daylight was precious, she might keep her appointment, she might be an hour or two late, or she might stay away altogether. Marian himself had suffered from her, had sworn never to employ her again and had gone back to her. Sefton, as he watched the blue smoke, found that her common accent jarred on him. It even seemed to make it more difficult for him to get the right presentation of the Aphrodite that she was helping him to paint. One seemed to demand a poetical and cultured soul in so beautiful a body. Rose Rose was not poetical nor cultured. She was not even businesslike and educated. Half an hour of silent and strenuous work followed, and then Sefton growled that he could not see any longer. "'We'll stop for today,' he said. Miss Rose Rose retired behind the screen. Sefton opened a window and both ventilators, and rolled another cigarette. The studio became rapidly cooler. "'Tomorrow at nine, he called out. "'I've got some way to come,' came the voice of Miss Rose from behind the screen. I could be here by a quarter past. Right, said Sefton, as he slipped on his coat. When Rose Rose emerged from the screen, she was dressed in a blue serge costume with a picture hat. As it was her business in life to be beautiful, she never wore corsets, high heels, nor pointed toes. Such abnegation is rare among models. I say, Mr. Sefton, said Rose, you were to settle at the end of the sittings, but— Oh, you don't want any money, Miss Rose. You're known to be rich. Well, what I've got is in the post office, and I don't want to touch it, and I've got some shopping I must do before I go home. Sefton pulled out his sovereign case hesitatingly. This is all very well, you know, he said. I know what you're thinking, Mr. Sefton. You think I don't mean to come tomorrow. That's all, Mr. Marion, now, isn't it? 
he's always saying things about me i'm not going to stick it i'm going to have it out with him he recommended you to me and i'll tell you what he said if you won't repeat it he said that i should be lucky if i got you and that i'd better chain you to the studio and all because i was once late with a good reason for it too besides what's once i suppose he didn't happen to tell you how often he's kept me waiting well here you are miss rose but you'll really be here in time tomorrow won't you otherwise the thing will have got too tacky to work into you needn't worry about that said miss rose eagerly i'll be here whatever happens by a quarter past nine i'll be here if i die first there is that good enough for you good afternoon and thank you mr sefton good afternoon miss rose here let me manage that door for you the key goes a bit stiffly sefton came back to his picture in spite of miss rose's vehement assurances he felt by no means sure of her but it was difficult for him to refuse any woman anything and impossible for him to refuse to pay her what he really owed he scrawled in charcoal some directions to the charwoman who would come in the morning she was from his point of view a prized charwoman one who could and did wash brushes properly one who understood the stove and would when required refrain from sweeping he picked up his hat and went out he walked the short distance from his studio to his bachelor flat looked over an evening paper as he drank his tea and then changed his clothes and took a cab to the club for dinner he played one game of billiards after dinner and then went home his picture was very much in his mind he wanted to be up fairly early in the morning and he went to bed early he was at his studio by half past eight the stove was lighted and he piled more coke on it his aphrodite seemed to have a somewhat mocking expression it was a little technical thing to be corrected easily he set his palette and selected his brushes an attempt to roll a cigarette revealed the fact that his pouch was empty it still wanted a few minutes to nine he would have time to go up to the tobacconist at the corner in case rose rose arrived while he was away he left the studio door open the tobacconist was also a news agent and he bought a morning paper rose would probably be twenty minutes late at the least and this would be something to occupy him but on his return he found his model already stepping on to the throne good morning miss rose you're a lady of your word he hardly heeded the murmur which came to him as a reply he threw his cigarette into the stove picked up his palette and got on excellently the work was absorbing for some time he thought of nothing else there was no relaxing on the part of the model no sign of fatigue he had been working for over an hour when his conscience smote him we'll have a rest now miss rose he said cheerily at the same moment he felt human fingers drawn lightly across the back of his neck just above the collar he turned round with a sudden start there was nobody there he turned back again to the throne rose rose had vanished with the utmost care and deliberation he put down his palette and brushes he said in a loud voice where are you miss rose for a moment or two silence hung in the hot air of the studio he repeated his question and got no answer and then he stepped behind the screen and suddenly the most terrible thing in his life happened to him he knew that his model had never been there at all there was only one door out to the back street in which his studio was placed and that door was now locked he unlocked it put on his hat and went out for a minute or two he paced the street but he had got to go back to the studio he went back sat down in the easy chair lit a cigarette and tried for a plausible explanation undoubtedly he had been working very hard lately when he had come back from the tobacconist to the studio he had been in the state of expectant attention and he was enough of a psychologist to know that in that state you are especially likely to see what you expect to see he was not conscious of anything abnormal in himself 
he did not feel ill or even nervous nothing of the kind had ever happened to him before the more he considered the matter the more definite became his state he was thoroughly frightened with a great effort he pulled himself together and picked up the newspaper it was certain that he could do no more work for that day anyhow an ordinary commonplace newspaper would restore him yes that was it he had been too much wrapped up in the picture he had simply supposed the model to be there he was quite unconvinced of course and merely trying to convince himself as an artist he knew that for the last hour or more he had been getting the most delicate modelling right from the living form before him but he did his best and read the newspaper assiduously he read of tariff protection and of the new music hall star and then his eye fell on a paragraph headed motor fatalities he read that miss rose an artist model had been knocked down by a car in the fulham road about seven o'clock on the previous evening that the owner of the car had stopped and taken her to the hospital and that she had expired within a few minutes of admission he rose from his place and opened a large pocket knife there was a strong impulse upon him and he felt it to be a mad impulse to slash the canvas to rags he stopped before the picture the face smiled at him with a sweetness that was scarcely earthly he went back to his chair again i'm not used to this kind of thing he said aloud a board creaked at the far end of the studio he jumped up with a start of horror a few minutes later he had left the studio and locked the door behind him his common sense was still with him he ought to go to a specialist but the picture what's the matter with sefton said divine one night at the club after dinner don't know that anything's the matter with him said marian he hasn't been here lately i saw him the last time he was here and he seemed pretty queer wanted to let me his studio it's not a bad studio said marian dispassionately he's got rid of it now anyhow he's got a studio out at richmond and the deuce of a lot of time he must waste getting there and back besides what does he do about models that's a point i've been wondering about myself said marian he'd got rose rose for his aphrodite and it looked as if it might be a pretty good thing when i saw it but as you know she died she was troublesome in some ways but taking her all round i don't know where to find anybody as good today what's sefton doing about it he hasn't got a model at all at present i know that for a fact because i asked him well said marian he may have got the thing on further than i thought he would in the time some chaps can work from memory all right though i can't do it myself he's not chucked the picture i suppose no he's not done that in fact the picture's his excuse now if you want him to go anywhere and do anything but that's not it the chap's altogether changed he used to be a genial sort of bounder a bit tyrannical in his manner perhaps thought he knew everything still you could talk to him he was sociable as a matter of fact he did know a good deal now it's quite different if you ever do see him and that's not often he's got nothing to say to you he's just going back to his work that sort of thing you're too imaginative said marian i never knew a man who varied less than sefton give me his address will you i mean his studio i'll go and look him up one morning i should like to see how that aphrodite's getting on i tell you it was promising no nonsense about it one sunny morning marian knocked at the door of the studio at richmond he heard the sound of footsteps crossing the studio then sefton's voice rang out who's there marian i've traveled miles to see the thing you call a picture i've got a model and what does that matter asked marian well i'd be awfully glad if you'd come back in an hour we'd have lunch together somewhere right said marian sardonically i'll come back in about seven million hours wait for me he went back to london and his own studio in a state of fury sefton had never been a man to pose he had never put on a side about his work 
he was always willing to show it to old and intimate friends whose judgment he could trust and now when the oldest of his friends had traveled down to richmond to see him he was told to come back in an hour and that they might then have lunch together this lets me out said marion savagely but he always speaks well of sefton nowadays he maintains that sefton's aphrodite would have been a success anyhow the suicide made a good deal of talk at the time and a special attendant was necessary to regulate the crowds round it when as directed by his will the picture was exhibited at the royal academy he was found in his studio many hours after his death and he had scrawled on a blank canvas much as he left his directions to his charwoman i have finished it but i can't stand any more end of chapter nine chapter number ten of stories in gray this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brianna. Stories in Gray by Barry Payne. Chapter 10. St. Martin's Summer. Judith Secombe's papa had white hair but a young heart, and a great capacity for enjoyment when it could be reconciled with his conscience. When he took the house in South Kensington, he told himself he did it entirely on Judith's account. She was seventeen. It was necessary that she should go about and see the world. She must make the acquaintance of his many friends. Judith, warring over the asphalt in a taxi cab, thought of a wood she knew where the bluebells made one sheet of color but London never bored her father. Tonight he had been quite apologetic. He had only been able to procure one stall for the first night of the Pinheiro play. His daughter could not go to the theatre alone, but he could. On the other hand, he had a guest in his house, an old friend, Gilbert Rayner by name. But Rayner showed him that he did not in the least wish to go to the theatre, and that he did not in the least mind being left alone. Judith and I will make some music, perhaps. So they dined rather earlier than usual, and even so, Judith's papa had to hurry off before the coffee had been brought. Isn't he wonderful, said Judith. He goes to everything. He does everything, he enjoys everything, and I myself am weary to death of it. When one does the same things over and over again, that is not amusement, that's business. Young people never understand the enthusiasms of the aged. We old people... You're not old, Judith interrupted. Forty-eight, said Rayner which is on the whole a little worse than sixty-eight. Numbers don't mean anything, said Judith. Come upstairs and I'll play to you. Presently Rayner sat before the fire in the big drawing room and listened to Beethoven's E minor sonata. The room was lit only by the candles at the piano and by the glow of the fire. Mrs. Rayner had not accompanied her husband on this visit. London was too noisy for her, and the country was too quiet. A provincial town on the sea coast met her requirements. As a rule, it met her husband's requirements as well. He did not care very much where he lived. They had been married twenty-four years and were the parents of two grown-up sons who had a passion for being correct that almost amounted to priggishness. In the inevitable course of nature and circumstance, 
The romance had died both for Gilbert and his wife. There was still affection. The chief evidence of it on her side was her suspiciousness. Love leaves a deposit of jealousy just as a river throws down mud. Listening now to the music, Gilbert thought about his family. About this time of the evening, Harold, the younger son, who was still at Oxford, would be talking dogmatically of his own fastidious tastes in wines. Frederick, the elder son, would possibly be examining with care in a magnifying glass the objects dearest to his heart. He was a philatelist and an expert. Mrs. Rayner would either be grumbling at a servant or reading a novel. These two splendid occupations nearly filled her life. It might all very easily have been so much worse. Harold knew too much about vintages, but he was not intemperate. Frederick would do very well in the bank in which his father was a senior partner. Mrs. Rayner had become slightly shrewish, but had no other bad habits and it might all very easily have been so much better. The color of life was fading for him into a gray monotone. There were no more great possibilities. A man of forty-eight, so Gilbert reflected, ought to be very fond of his dinner. There is nothing else left of which he can be very fond. His eyes fell on Judith. She was playing now the ecstatic melody of the second movement, and her eyes shimmered in the candlelight under dark lashes. He could remember her as a child of eight. With a sudden impulse, he got up and walked to the door. He ran his hand over the switches of the electric light. White light suddenly applied changes very often the train of one thought, and his own thoughts were getting too much in tune with the evening, with the firelight, with the music, with the faint perfume of the heavy drooping tulips on the mantelpiece. An evening paper lying on the table was a further corrective. He opened it, at the city intelligence, and read with care the figures which showed him what rubber and oil were doing. The music stopped. Judith came and stood beside him, leaning one arm on the mantelpiece. In this position, the loose white sleeves fell back. She looked down at him, and under her gaze, he moved uneasily in his chair. He folded the newspaper and flung it down. Why did you do that just, she asked. All these lights, I mean. I wanted, he said, to see the price of shell transport. She walked to the door and paused with one hand poised over the switches. Do you mind, she said. I don't like very much light tonight. Again, the room was lit only by the glow of the fire and by the candles at the piano. She knelt down on the hearth rug, spreading almost transparent hands to the fire. What was the price of shell transport? she asked. The question was unexpected, and he gave the true answer. I don't know, he said. She sighed deeply. Take me away with you, she said suddenly. The tone of the voice was serious, almost as if she had meant what she said. Where shall we go? he asked in the same tone. I don't think I mind very much. I should like it to be so far away that it took us days to get there. It must be a lonely place too. He looked at her and said nothing wondering what was happening and why, what might possibly be going to happen. Her voice shook a little as she spoke. Do you love me so very, very much? she said. 
It was not till that moment that he knew how very, very much he did love her. Why do you think so? he asked. Tell me about it. I know about you, she said. Don't you know about me too? What is it you have to tell me? She rose to her feet and walked a few steps away from him. Her back was turned to him as she spoke. I love you very, very much, she said. I love you more than all the world. I know it's wicked and I don't mind it. I know I had never meant to say it, and I have said it. He was a guest in the house of the girl's father, his own old friend. About a hundred miles further north, an elderly, thin-lipped lady, probably complaining at the moment that the silver candlestick that would light her to her rest had been imperfectly cleaned, had a sure claim upon him and had once loved him. A smooth-haired young man, counting the perforations of a forged colonial stamp, had also a right to expect that his elderly father should not bring scandal upon the family. But there was also the girl, Judith, to think about, standing trembling in the dim light and waiting for him. Here, in this quiet room, at this very moment, was, he knew, the last chance of poetry and of paradise. In a flash, he saw his whole course clear in his mind. He went to her, put his arms around her, and kissed her on the mouth. He said nothing. For a moment or two, she rested her head on his shoulder. And then she went back to the fire again and knelt down and spread out her hands as before. They heard now the sharp burr of the electric bell downstairs. Judith smiled faintly and warmly. He has forgotten his latchkey again, she said. He always forgets it. Listen, said Gilbert, this is our goodbye. We can have no more than we have had. It will be a secret between us, and I shall never forget it. I am called away on business early tomorrow morning. Do you see? She nodded, caught his hand and kissed it, and went to the piano. She began to play once more the melody of the second movement. The door opened and Judith's papa entered, rubbing his rather fat white hands together and looking pleased with the world. Well, you two people, he said, you have missed the most glorious evening. Judith did not appear at breakfast next morning and soon afterwards Gilbert Raynor received the necessary telegram and had his bag packed. His conscience did not trouble him. He felt more at peace with the world than he had done for a long time past. When some five years later, Judith married quite as well as she could have been expected, he sent her a little silver statuette by an artist of great repute, but did not attend the ceremony. Two years afterwards, they met in Paris, and with a look of clear innocence in her beautiful eyes, she introduced him to her husband. Mr. Rayner, a very old friend of my father's, he used to know me when I was quite a little kid. End of chapter 10 Recording by Brianna Chapter 11 of Stories in Grey this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Stories in Grey by Barry Payne. The Doll, Part 1. A wax doll, please, said the woman, and the shopman, conjecturing from her appearance the amount she would spend, showed her something at two shillings. 
Certainly Miss Mordaunt was not wealthy, and did not look wealthy. Her dress was severely plain. She might have looked much prettier than she did, for she had fine eyes and beautiful dark hair. She would not cut her hair, but she packed it into the smallest possible compass, converting the glory of the woman into a neat, hard parcel. Her age was thirty-two, and she earned thirty shillings a week. But the two-shilling doll did not please her. "'Not made to take off, I see,' she said rather disdainfully. "'No, miss,' the shopman admitted. "'But we have a better article here with the removable clothing. Four and two, this one. A nice thing.' Miss Mordaunt took it up tenderly. She made it shut and open its eyes, but it did not satisfy her. "'I think,' she said, "'the, uh, the little girl would prefer a larger one.' Her hesitation in this speech was due to the fact that she was unused to deceit. The doll was not intended for any little girl. There was no little girl in the question. Finally, Miss Mordaunt, who made thirty shillings a week, bought an eight-shilling doll. "'Practically a work of art,' said the shopman, as he folded soft paper about it and packed it in its box. "'A very nice thing indeed, sure to give pleasure. Really, he seemed almost reluctant to part with it. He tried to turn the conversation to the toy gyroscope and the animated skeleton, an ingenious little thing. But Miss Mordaunt said gravely that she did not require anything further. She departed with the doll in its box. The box had a neat little loop of string for her to hold it by, but she did not use the loop. She nursed the box in the fold of her arm. There was much noise at the corner of Tottenham Court Road. Motor omnibuses banged and rattled, impatient to get on with their load of home-returning clerks. A cabman flicked a barking dog with the end of his whip, and the dog howled. Boys shouted, "'Football edition!' There was so much noise that what Miss Mordaunt said to the box on her arm was quite inaudible. She said, "'Soon be home now, darling.' Yet Miss Mordaunt was not insane. Insane people cannot earn thirty shillings a week in the office of a Holborn cycle manufacturer, as Miss Mordaunt did. She had gone there at eighteen shillings a week, and in four years she had made this considerable advance— even now the manager considered that she was well worth her money. Mr. Fort, who kept the books, said that Miss Mordaunt was a bit snappy, but he admired her. The old woman who cleaned out the office considered that she was a nice-spoken lady. James, who took longer over an errand than any other boy in London, said that Miss Mordaunt was not his style, so far as looks were concerned, but that she was all right so long as you didn't start monkeying. Different people have different ideas about the same person, but there would have been a unanimous opinion that Miss Mordaunt was quite sane, and Harley Street would have endorsed that opinion. Yet Miss Mordaunt, aged thirty-two, had just bought an eight-shilling doll for herself and for nobody else. Why? She was a woman. Fate had made her a worker, the office was making her a machine, and Edith Stafford was trying to make her a fighter. She was all alone, and no man loved her. But she was a woman— and the very same thing made her buy that doll that has made other women perform the greatest acts of courage and self-sacrifice. If you like, you may call it the maternal instinct. Even the purchase of a doll involved some self-sacrifice for this woman with thirty shillings a week. She lived in a tiny flat in a back street, and did everything for herself. The flat consisted of two small rooms and a box of a kitchen, and everything in it was intensely neat and orderly. The little flat had marked in advance— at eighteen shillings a week she had been discontented with a single room and much discomfort. But now, why, this was her home, and she had almost all that she wanted, but not quite all. She lifted the doll out of its box, kissed it, patted its hair, smoothed its clothes, and made it sit down on a chair. She said, You must wait just a few minutes, Cynthia. Be good. She put the box with the other card boxes that she had kept, because they might be useful, on the top of her wardrobe. She lit the gas ring in the kitchen and put on the kettle. Then she prepared her supper. There was a tinned tongue in the cupboard, and that tongue had certainly formed part of her intentions. But if you have been buying eight-shilling dolls, you can do very well on cocoa, bread, and apricot jam, the last being used with great restraint. So the tin remained unopened. We all eat far too much anyhow. All this while Cynthia had waited patiently and had been good, as directed. But now she was brought up to the table— and Miss Mordaunt talked to her a little during the banquet. "'Much nicer than that stuffy shop, isn't it, Cynthia? And what do you think I am going to do after supper? I'm going to make you the very doviest white silk nightgown you ever saw. You'll be quite a princess, and you shall have a little cot by the side of your mother's bed and be ever so happy.' 
Miss Mordaunt did not always speak quite so prettily as this. If she was typing a letter at the office and the machine jibbed, she habitually said one brief bad word. It always made Mr. Fort laugh, and that laugh always made Miss Mordaunt very angry. She was never angry with the old woman who cleaned the office. As she worked at the white silk nightdress, she gave Cynthia information in a low voice. Miss Mordaunt confessed that so far she had been lonely. She had girl friends, of course, plenty of them, but she had always wanted a little girl of her own. She might have bought a dog, but who was to look after him while his mistress was away at work? Cynthia was better than six dogs. Fortunately, Cynthia had permanently an expression of pleased attention, obliterated only when you laid her on her back, and by a simple mechanical contrivance her eyes closed. Miss Mordaunt was explaining to Cynthia what a remarkably good time she was going to have, when a light ripple of piano music broke in on the conversation, stopped, and then began again. "'Hear that?' said Miss Mordaunt. "'I'll tell you what it means, Cynthia. It means that they've let the flat next door at last, and that the girl moved in today. We shall have to come to some agreement with her about that piano. She seems to play very well, but there must be regular hours for it. I can't hold a meeting of the WWLS in my rooms with that noise going on, and as I've got to earn the bread and butter all day, I can't afford to be kept awake by a piano half the night. I'll tackle the good lady on the subject before I go to work tomorrow. And now, Cynthia, we'll see how you look in your new nightdress. But for the moment, this operation had to be deferred. There came a sharp rap at the outer door, and Cynthia, and all that belonged to her, were hurriedly deposited in the bedroom. Then Miss Mordaunt admitted Miss Edith Stafford. Miss Stafford was tall, thin, jerky, and plain. Her eyes peered bitterly from behind a gold-rimmed pince-nez. She did not kiss Miss Mordaunt. She abhorred all unhygienic things, especially if they were at all natural. Cigarettes were an exception. "'Evening, Grace,' said Miss Stafford. "'Looked in to see why you weren't at the WWLS last night. "'I'd had an awfully hard day. I didn't feel up to it.' "'Nonsense,' said Miss Stafford, taking a manly pose in the armchair and producing a leather cigarette case. The WWLS was the Working Women's Literary Society. It consisted of seven members and held fortnightly meetings. Had it consisted of more than seven, they could hardly have met in Miss Mordaunt's sitting room when her turn came round. Even as it was, two bedroom chairs had to be impressed for these great occasions. "'Nonsense,' repeated Miss Stafford. "'Women are only tired because they think they are. It's one of the ways in which the ordinary woman makes herself ridiculous and keeps back the movement.' "'Still, you didn't miss much this time. "'Margaret Jackson lost her temper as usual. "'About Keats. "'By the way, she said something to me about you afterwards.' "'Indeed, what was it? "'That man Fort. "'Do you mean to marry him?' "'Never, of course not. "'Why?' "'Margaret Jackson heard through a friend of hers "'who knows Fort's young brother "'that Fort said you had been much pleasanter "'in your manner of late. "'Then Mr. Fort will change his mind about that tomorrow. "'Good,' said Edith Stafford, "'with a jerk of her cigarette hand. "'This is no time for women to marry.' My word, if all the pretty girls thought as I do about that, women would be free within a year. I'm glad you're with me at any rate. Grace Mordaunt blushed slightly. She thought that Mr. Fort was common, uneducated, and unprepossessing. But she also thought that she was very lonely. A further eruption of music spared her any discussion of matrimony. What a horrible row, said Miss Stafford. Yes, said Grace. It's the girl next door. I'm going to speak about it tomorrow. I should. One can hardly hear oneself talk. Well, I only looked in for two minutes. She jerked her cigarette end into the fireplace, reminded Miss Morden that it was her turn to entertain the WWLS at their next meeting, and said a brief good night. When she had gone, Miss Morden undressed Cynthia and tried on the white silk nightgown. Alterations were required in the neck and were duly effected. Miss Morden went to sleep that night with the doll in her arms. Part Two after breakfast next morning, Miss Mordaunt went to remonstrate with the girl next door about the piano. She meant to arrange it all in a friendly chat, to point out that there must be a certain amount of give and take in flats. The plan was modified in its execution by the fact that there was no girl next door. The proprietor of the piano was a man, an enraged, fantastic, middle-aged male musician, who had a fine flow of language but behaved much like a distraught and irritable baby. His name was Malcolm Harverson, and he was a musician and composer, as he told her before she had got through the first two sentences of what she had to say. He glared at her with large blue eyes. He ran his good white hands through his excessive crop of fair hair. He gesticulated. 
"'What am I to do? "'What on earth do you expect me to do? "'Do you know I've been turned out of more flats "'than any man in London? "'The other tenants always combine against me. "'At last I thought I was safe. "'There are no regulations whatever "'about piano playing in these flats. "'Not the shadow of a ghost of a regulation. "'I was jolly careful to find that out "'before I took this dog kennel, "'and on the second morning after my arrival "'I've hardly finished my breakfast. "'Beastly eggs that I had to cook for myself "'because I can't find a servant.' "'when a charming lady comes round to tell me to burn my Beckstein and go to the devil.' "'Miss Mordaunt resisted with some difficulty a tendency to smile at this elderly child. "'I don't think that's quite what I said, is it? "'You can play as much as you like until six in the evening, "'and some evenings you can play from six to ten unless I ask you not to, "'but not after ten, because—' "'Mr. Malcolm Harvison clasped his head with both hands. "'Oh, wait a minute, please. "'How do you expect anybody to remember all that?' I can't get up at six in the morning, and as for ten at night, why, there are lots of days when I don't really begin to live till ten at night. There ought to be a certain amount of give and take in flats. Miss Mordaunt was slightly disconcerted by this phrase, which she had intended to use herself. And nobody ever hears me complain. There's a woman in the flat over mine who has got a sewing machine in C minor. Perfectly beastly. Yet I don't go running round as you do, shouting to have her crucified. Miss Mordaunt tried to explain that she neither ran nor shouted. She did not require him to burn his piano. She did not want him to be crucified. But as she had to rise early to get the work of her flat done before she went to the office at ten— That reminds me, said Mr. Harverson. The way in which he interrupted ladies was quite shameless. I suppose you couldn't tell me of any old woman who'd come in and do the work of this flat for me. If she arrived somewhere about eight in the morning and looked in again in the evening in the neighborhood of nine, that would—perhaps I might be able to find somebody, said Miss Mordaunt. "'but that's not what I wanted to talk about.' "'She explained once more what it was that she wanted. "'He remained quite unsatisfactory. "'He would do his best, but he didn't like to make any promises, "'because, so he said, he knew his limitations and he might forget. "'By the way, he hoped she would not forget to find that servant for him, "'because really things were getting rather serious. "'Miss Mordaunt had to hurry away in order to be punctual at her business. "'She had two minutes with Mrs. Fagg, the old woman who cleaned the office.' "'Yes,' said Mrs. Fagg. "'I could do this, Mr. Iverson, if he suited me, and the work would fit in nicely. "'He's all right, miss, I suppose.' "'Yes, I think so. But he's like most men, not fit to take care of himself. "'Then I'll just call on him this morning and judge for myself, saying as you sent me. "'Thank you in any case, miss.' "'Miss Mordaunt enjoyed the day's work which followed more than Mr. Fort did. "'Mr. Fort was not in the least in love with Miss Mordaunt, "'but he had determined that she would be just the right wife for him.' She was good-looking, she was thoroughly sensible and practical, a little short in the temper, but Mr. Fort recognized that he had reached an age when a man must not be too particular, and that one may have to wait a long time for absolute perfection. Besides, once married, he thought that he could deal with that shortness of temper. Certainly of late she had been distinctly more civil to him. Therefore Mr. Fort this morning adopted a manner towards Miss Mordaunt which was oleaginous and slightly intimate. What Miss Mordaunt said could have been telegraphed for sixpence, but it was enough, metaphorically, to take the skin off Mr. Fort. He observed to a friend at luncheon that women were queer cattle. A stream of music greeted Miss Mordaunt that night as she came up the stairs. Mr. Malcolm Harverson was singing to his own accompaniment. He had a very fair baritone voice, and it had been well trained. Above all, he was an artist. Miss Mordaunt was in the mood for music and was glad that Mr. Harverson had apparently forgotten her injunction. But the moment she closed her door, the music stopped abruptly. So Miss Mordaunt talked to Cynthia instead. Cynthia was sitting, curiously enough, just where Miss Mordaunt had left her in the morning, on the cushions of the one easy chair, and she still wore the expression of pleased attention. Miss Mordaunt said that Cynthia had behaved very nicely, and that she was pleased to see her again. Then she spoke about the music. "'It would have been more sensible, Cynthia, if he had just finished that song and then left off. "'Men are always so stupidly literal. "'Or perhaps he's turned sulky. "'I suppose you couldn't tell me if he's been playing much during the day.' "'She was correct. Cynthia could not. "'Miss Mordaunt was opening that tinned tongue with her accustomed neatness "'when she was called to the door. "'A man asked if she were Miss Mordaunt, and, assured on this point, "'delivered a florist's box into her hands.' It contained white roses and the card of Mr. Malcolm Harvison. On the card was written, With many thanks for the much more useful present you sent me this morning. I refer to Mrs. Fagg. Since he put it like that, she felt that she might accept them. 
She loved flowers, but her expenditure upon them was of necessity limited. She placed the white roses on her supper table and invited Cynthia to admire them. Then she did devastating work on that tinned tongue. One might almost have thought that tinned tongue did not cost money, but Miss Mordaunt was happy and hungry. Later in the evening she wrote a brief note of thanks to Mr. Harverson, and she made a fur toque for Cynthia. Part 3 Days passed away, and every day Mr. Harverson's piano stopped dumb when Miss Mordaunt returned from her work in the evening. It was silly of him to sulk in this way, and she made up her mind that she would tell him so. It was only on special evenings which would be indicated to him that she required silence from six till ten. On the other evenings it would be quite enough if the piano stopped at ten or thereabouts. The meeting of the WWLS in her rooms gave her an opportunity. Miss Mordaunt possessed just six teacups, but the members of the WWLS had the Wordsworthian habit of being seven. She was preparing her room for the meeting when she remembered the necessity for one more cup. She had meant to acquire it during the day, and had forgotten it. It struck her now that she might borrow a teacup from Mr. Harverson, and she could at the same time explain to him that she did not hate music so much as he thought. He showed no sign of sulkiness when he admitted her to his flat. He made her come into his sitting-room while he went to find a cup which was worthy of being used by a literary society. The sitting-room was principally occupied by a short grand piano and many books. It smelled pleasantly of Russia leather and Turkish cigarettes. As he came back with the teacup, he asked plaintively if there would soon be an evening when he might play after six. You might have played any of these evenings. It was only on evenings when I especially asked for quiet that you were not to play. He sat down suddenly and nearly broke the teacup. That's me, he said. If I can get anything the wrong way round, I always do. I thought it was only on evenings when I received a special permission that I was allowed to play. Of course, I had to do what you wanted, after all your kindness in getting Mrs. Fagg for me, but I've been feeling very virtuous and conceited about it. Why, it's simply a case of the ten-five over again. What was that? asked Miss Mordaunt, smiling. I had to go north to a rehearsal of some stuff of mine. I looked up a train and fixed on the ten-five. That was all right. But then the thing that I have to use instead of a mind switched the figures round, and I decided that it was the five-ten I had to catch. I got up very early and had no time for any breakfast, and I caught the 5.10. At least, I should have caught it if it had been there. There wasn't any 5.10, of course. The porter who told me so laughed, and my own cabman laughed. I wished I was dead. Miss Mordaunt said she was so sorry, but she seemed rather amused. I can't understand it. I cannot understand how anybody with the gift of music, like you, shouldn't be able to manage little practical things. Sometimes I doubt if music is a gift at all. I'm inclined to think it's a vice. Anyhow, it's just those little practical things which bowl me over. I believe I ought to advertise for an attendant, one of those men in black morning coats and felt hats that take the soft-headed old gentleman out for walks at the health resorts. Well, said Miss Mordaunt, it's most awfully kind of you to have stopped playing on my account, and I'm almost ashamed now that I bothered you about it. Now I've got the literary society, and so I can't ask you to play tonight. Of course not. "'But I hope you'll play tomorrow night just as much as you like, and—' "'Why, there's somebody at my door. "'Good night, and thanks so much.' "'It was Miss Edith Stafford with a notebook "'containing the minutes of the WWLS. "'I'm early,' said Miss Stafford. "'Thought you might want a hand to get the room ready.' "'Thanks awfully. "'Everything's all right now. "'I've just been borrowing a teacup.' "'Ah,' said Miss Stafford. "'The girl next door. "'I remember. "'Hope you've persuaded her to stop that tinkle box of hers tonight.' "'Yes, she won't play tonight,' said Miss Mordaunt, blushing. "'It has already been observed that Miss Mordaunt had no natural tendency towards deceit. "'The meeting was quite successful. "'Miss Tilbury read a thoughtful paper on some obscure passages in the work of Robert Browning. "'Miss Jackson animadverted severely upon it. "'Miss Edith Stafford pointed out that it was only men who wrote obscurely. "'The woman writer was always lucid at any rate.' Miss Tomlin said that this reminded her of a story, which she told. It was quite a good story about a lady who bred prize Persian cats, and nobody knew, or cared, how Miss Tomlin came to be reminded of it. Then there was tea, and Miss Mordaunt drank from a blue cup that did not match the rest of the set. Miss Stafford asked her what the girl next door was like, and Miss Mordaunt, blushing, said that she did not know, and changed the subject rapidly. Miss Mordaunt told Cynthia in bed that night, that it had been quite a pleasant evening. 
she also acquitted mr harverson of sulkiness and observed that he seemed to be rather well off had good furniture and took cabs and that sort of thing to this cynthia listened patiently but from the accident of her position with her eyes closed on the following evening miss mordaunt had just finished supper and was telling cynthia about some further additions to her wardrobe when the sound of mr harverson's piano interrupted her miss mordaunt listened with delight at the end of the piece she clapped her hands gently by way of applause then there came a knock at the door and with some confusion she admitted mr harverson he stared round the room with his large blue eyes and they took in cynthia whom miss mordaunt had forgotten to remove but mr harverson who was not more confused than usual said nothing whatever about the doll though cynthia was wearing the new fur toque and looked charming he said that he had overheard the sound of applause and that if miss mordaunt really liked the music she would hear it better on the other side of the wall wouldn't she come round with him miss mordaunt accepted a little surprised at herself for accepting she took the one easy chair in the room that smelled of russia leather and cigarettes and mr harverson demanded what he should play for her if you've got a beethoven handy i'm fond of the moonlight sonata good old moonlight said mr harverson irreverently all the schoolgirls have to go through it just like the measles but however and without troubling to find the music mr harverson sat down and played the moonlight sonata and he did not play irreverently at all i suppose it's old-fashioned she said when he had finished but it's terribly lovely yes said harverson beethoven's fine of course if he'd had the modern piano there'd have been a difference still yes very fine i say miss mordaunt I forgot to have any coffee after dinner tonight, and restaurant coffee's rather rotten anyhow. I wish you'd help me to make some. Won't it keep you awake? No, if I don't have it I can't sleep. I'm all wrongly constituted, and don't fit into the textbooks. So Miss Mordaunt helped him to make coffee, and afterwards helped him to drink it. She felt it necessary to say that she had not intended her applause to be overheard. No, cried Malcolm Harverson, but these walls are very thin. I can even hear when you're talking to your little friend in the evening. I can't hear what's said, of course, or I'd have warned you, but I catch the murmur of the voice. What little friend? asked Miss Mordaunt, perturbed. The doll, of course. You do talk to her, don't you? Uh, yes, said Miss Mordaunt. You see, you needn't explain, said Harverson. Bless you, I know. That sort of thing is easy to understand. If one didn't understand it, one couldn't make music properly. Harverson and Miss Mordaunt met again the next night, and the next, and the next. Malcolm Harverson and Grace Mordaunt being what they were, the story could have but one ending, a happy ending. She was pleased that it was not until after she had accepted him that she read in the papers an account of the festival, with lavish and unusual praise for a work by Malcolm Harverson. Miss Edith Stafford said that she had known all along how it would be, and had seen it coming. This prescience seemed to be some slight consolation to her. Part 4 Some years later, when the newspapers had quite got into the habit of speaking of Malcolm Harverson as the eminent composer, Mrs. Harverson decided to give her little daughter a doll. She confessed that it was not quite a new doll. In fact, it was one that she had formerly played with herself. Miss Cynthia Harverson, who had not begun to worry about arithmetic, said that she supposed in that case it would be about a hundred years old. "'Getting on that way,' said her mother. "'But it's got the loveliest clothes that I made for it myself, and it shuts its eyes when it lies down, and it's got the same name as yourself.' "'Let's see,' said Miss Harverson. The doll and its somewhat elaborate wardrobe were produced, and Miss Harverson was delighted with them. But she put one finger in her mouth and sucked it, the sure concomitant in her case of a mental process. Then she observed that her mother must have been no end of a child if she could make dolls' clothes like that. But I was much older than you are when I made those clothes, dear. How old were you? I don't like to think about it. Ever so much older than I am now. They were still busy about the doll when Grace heard her husband calling her. I say, my dear, he said, I've got to send ten shillings to a man in Brussels. How does one do it? Grace crossed the passage to her husband's room. "'Give me the letter and the money. I'll do it for you. "'You haven't changed one little bit,' she said, laughing. "'Then she sat down and added seriously, "'I've given Cynthia the doll, and she's quite in love with it.'" End of chapter 11
Chapter Twelve of Stories in Grey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julia Mihaela. Stories in Grey by Barry Payne. Chapter Twelve. Too soon and too late. The waiter placed before young Mr. Hines a plate on which were a few white bones, an eyeball, and a piece of black mackintosh. Turbot, sir, said the waiter in an explanatory voice. It was a hotel dinner in an English cathedral city and faithful to its type. The green Venetian blinds were drawn down, and the incandescent gas was shaded with pink paper. The walls were covered with a material that is supposed to simulate Jacobin oak panelling. It may be acquitted of any actual deceit. The room was full and that the small tables were many of those middle-aged or aged women that seem to haunt the provincial hotels of this country. They are a class by themselves. They wear brown skirts and a totally different blouse in the evening, and Grandmamma has a grey woolen shawl. They speak in whispers and peck patiently any odds and ends that the waiter gives them. They have an air of defective vitality and chronic discontent. They nearly all suffer from guitar and use eucalyptus on their handkerchiefs. Observe, too, their surreptitiousness. When the elderly lady, hand to mouth and eyes glazed with terror, has given the waiter an order, so hushed as to be almost inaudible, and then proceeds to build up a screen at her right hand with the wine list and cruet stand, you may be pretty certain that there will presently be a little weak whiskey and soda on the far side of the entanglement. There were two waiters in the room. The elder of them was English, had been there for years, and under the favourable influence of a cathedral atmosphere had already grown much of the manner and appearance of an archdeacon. The younger, a sad-eyed Italian of eighteen, had only been at the hotel two months, but he looked every inch in acolyte. It was the archdeacon who had placed that plate of alleged turbot before young Maurice Hines. Turbot, is it? said Mr. Hines. Interesting relic. Now take it back to the cat again and bring me something to eat. Suddenly, from the little table next to him, came a wild burst of laughter. It broke out like a discharge of steam from a locomotive. It bubbled with pure joy. It stopped abruptly and then started again uncontrollably. It broke up all the holy calm of that table d'hote. Withered virgins of fifty turned round to look at this laughing girl, some with a sniff of disapproval, others compelled to one responsive smile. The archdeacon waiter seemed pained. The acolyte was proceeding with his work with apparent calm, when suddenly the laughter infection smote him full in the midriff. He dropped a helping of cabinet pudding, put a hand over his mouth, bolted into the passage, slapped his leg, exploded, and was asked what the devil he thought he was doing. In the dining room the girl still laughed at intervals. Control yourself, I beg, said her flustered German governess. It is hysteria. Hush, hush! Rui, Celia, it is so rude. Celia shook her head. Can't help it, Fraulein, she gasped. Anything about a cat makes me laugh. And she relapsed again. Maurice Hines hadn't had the faintest intention of being amusing. It was out of the bitterness of his soul that he had spoken. He had already declined to believe that over-diluted meat extract with some memorial bearings and stamped carrot constituted julienne soup. This supposed turbot was more than he could endure. He was an artist, eupeptic and creative, and he had been travelling all day. On the morrow he was to begin the presentation portrait of a scholarly canon with a fine head. Now, if ever, dinner was a positive necessity. He sent for the manageress. The manageress was all black satin and superciliousness when she arrived. But only the black satin was left by the time Heinz had finished with her. He was under the impression that he was being merely firm. But it seems to me that when you tell the manageress of the principal hotel in the cathedral city that she is not fit to cater for a troop of performing fleas, you go beyond firmness. At any rate, he was effectual. He received immediately more turbid than had ever been given to one man at one time since the foundation of the hotel. His helping from the joint was such that he was almost, but not quite, ashamed to demand a second. And the omelette of viseur, which came as a peace offering at the end of the repast, was exclusive matter for Mr. Hines, Esquire only, and not in the contract. His sunny temper returned. He consulted affably with the head waiter on the grave question of port, and now, for the first time, he turned his head to see who the cheeky kid was who had laughed at his righteous indignation. He saw a tall girl of fifteen, 
with an elderly governess. The governess was peeling walnuts, and the girl was eating them. This seemed to argue devotion on the part of the governess. The girl had an Irish beauty of dark hair and blue eyes, and her face followed her every thought with marvellous expressiveness. The mouth was sweet and sensitive. Heinz thought she had lovely colour, but would be the devil to paint. One lightning glance showed her that he was looking at her. She flushed slightly, knowing that she had been really too awful, but she also smiled, because she remembered the cat. Nice kid, thought Heinz. When she had gone, the effect was much as if the incandescent gas had been lowered. There was no longer any young vitality in the room, nothing but a few groups of elderly grey women over their walnuts, pecking, cracking, mumbling, sniffing. Waiter, said Heinz to the acolyte, take my port into the smoking room. The smoking room was equally depressing. It seemed to be furnished principally with spittoons and advertisements of auction sales, and an aged smell of bad beer hovered over it. Heinz endured it for the length of two cigarettes, and then his eye caught, framed on the wall, that successful Christmas number plate, Won't a keys doggy? Heinz groaned and fled. The room he next tried was the drawing room, and to prevent any possibility of mistake, its name had been painted on the door. Here the furniture was more ambitious, and a long tail piano stood open. The room was empty, and only one gas jet had been lit. Heinz ran one hand over the keyboard, and was surprised to find that the instrument was in tune. He sat down and began modulating idly, from one key into another, as his thoughts wandered. Presently he began to play a waltz of Chopin's, old passion and incense. He didn't hear the door open and close. It was only as he played the last notes that he found he now had an audience. There were two old ladies with their knitting. There was a German governess engaged on a beadwork cover for a spectacle case. And there was Celia, quite serious now, and with excited eyes coming straight towards him. It was too lovely, she cried. I wish I could have gone on forever. She held out her hand to him. Thank you, thank you. Now, more than ever, did consternation fall upon Fräulein. She lived in a perpetual state of terror as to what Celia would do next. And Celia always did it. She was full now of incoherent reproof to Celia and apologies to Heinz. She is on bolsive. Heinz rose from the piano, laughing. Ah, seien Sie nicht böse, he said. Es freut mich ja, dass Sie meine dumme Musik gern hört. If he had really told her in English not to mind, and that he was glad his silly music had pleased them, he would have made much less impression. In the eyes of Fräulein, the fact that he spoke her native tongue consecrated him, and Celia sat up till nearly eleven that night, and went to bed filled with music and adoration. Next morning, Heinz was precisely an hour late for his appointment with the scholarly canon with a fine head. His story in excuse about a missing tube of colour was plausible and fairly amusing, but had no foundation in fact. He had spent that hour in making two rapid drawings of Celia, effective things in sanguine and grey paper, and then Celia and her governess had departed, in continuance of a holiday tour, to places of historical and educational interest. At the end of ten years, on a late afternoon in June, Maurice Hines came back to that hotel again. London had become suddenly intolerable to him. He was tired of his work, and he was still more tired of his play, if the wearing social functions that before the fashionable portrait painter are to be called play. He wanted to fly away and be at rest. If he hadn't the wings of a dove, he had at any rate a good motor car, and he drove it himself. He had no particular destination in view when he started. He had driven a hundred miles before he decided that he might as well stop at the old cathedral city that night. He found little change at the hotel. The same black satin manager still extended turbots beyond their natural limit. But the archidiaconal waiter had increased in girth and in stateliness of movement, and had a new acolyte. The sad-eyed Italian had given place to a straw-coloured German. Maurice Hines dined well, having taken precautionary measures to that end. As soon as he had recalled himself to the memory of the manageress, she had recognised that this was not an occasion for trifling. But it seemed that other visitors were not being so well treated. From a little table behind him, Heinz heard much grumbling in a querulous man's voice. Food not fit for a cat. 
was one phrase he caught. A woman answered briefly, in a low and gentle voice, and Heinz, without hearing what she said, was conscious that she was being bored intolerably. Heinz looked round. The woman sat with her back to Heinz. She wore a black lace tea gown and leaned back in her chair. The man opposite to her was about fifty years of age and of unprepossessing appearance. He had that thing which is hardly ever seen except on the stage, a red nose. He had also a mean mouth and the most abominable and Shakespearean expense of forehead. It was only as these two people passed out of the room that Heinz caught a glimpse of the woman's face and recognized that this was Celia. This was the laughing girl that he had met ten years before. The man was evidently her husband. She was very beautiful, as she had promised to be, but the expression on her face was very sad. It's a long way from fifteen to twenty-five, and many changes before in that decade. It was to him something more than an impressive coincidence. Suddenly, this highly successful artist saw his life as a failure. He was convinced that he should have married Celia, and he was convinced that they would have been happy. But the first time he had met her, ten years before, she had been too young for love. He had found her beauty adorable, and had liked her immensely as a child, but until this moment she had remained in his memory as a sketch and sanguine on grey paper, nothing else. He had shown no prescience. He hadn't guessed at the fruition of the unborn summers. For an evening and a morning he had seen her, and then had allowed the clue of her life to slip out of his hands. And now chance mocked him once more with the sight of her, now that she was married to that miserable little man, with a red nose and plaintive voice, now that she was unhappy, now that it was too late. Yet, though it was too late, he now went into the drawing-room and began to play the same music that he had played ten years before. He felt certain that if she heard it, it would bring her to him. He wasn't mistaken. She paused for a moment in the open doorway, and then came towards him, smiling and self-possessed. "'I didn't know you were staying in the hotel,' she said, and then added quickly, "'You do remember me, don't you?' "'Yes, Celia,' he said, as he shook hands with her. "'I remember you very well. I caught a glimpse of you as you were going out of the dining-room. I recognized you at once. I was wondering if you would remember this.' His hands on the piano repeated a phrase of the music. Of course I remember it, but I'm not silly any more. I'm Mrs. Owen. Oh, no, said Heinz, laughing. When one has called the child by her Christian name, one calls the woman by her Christian name. I shall certainly call you Celia. You can, if you like. Now tell me all about it. All about what? All about the last ten years of your life. What is there to tell? I have done nothing. I was married when I was eighteen. Since then I have gone on existing. Now you, on the contrary, have had a splendid... Have you got any children, Celia? He asked suddenly. She shook her head. Perhaps it is as well, she said drearily. I don't think my husband would like children. He's an archaeologist, you know. That is why we're here. He's making rubbings of grasses in the cathedral. He has a great collection of them, all beautifully catalogued. How perfectly horrible! said Heinz with conviction. For the first time she laughed. So you still laugh sometimes, he said. Not very often now. But I remember what you mean. I believe I behaved abominably. I overheard something you said about a cat. It was your own private joke, and I didn't know you, and had no right to laugh at it. I don't know why, but jokes about cats specially appealed to me then. Now, I don't think cats are any more amusing than anything else, do you? Yes, um, no, I don't know. Are you happy, Celia? I knew you were going to ask that. Well, are you? Oh, of course I am. Perfectly. And by way of proving it, she added, with a sob in her voice, that she must go, that Harry would wonder where she was. He let her go. At breakfast next morning, Mr. Morris Hines very deliberately introduced himself to Mr. Henry Owen. Celia wasn't yet down. Mr. Owen was pleased to be very gracious. He said that Celia had told him about Mr. Hines, and that it was a pleasure to meet so distinguished an artist. You gave my wife a little sketch you made of her when she was a girl, I think. I did. 
Well, I did a silly thing about that. It was soon after our marriage. A friend of mine came along and offered me a fiver for it, and I took it. I see. And your wife didn't like it. Oh, she was angry enough. But that's not what I mean. If I had only known then that you were the common man, I would never have sold that sketch for a fiver. What would it be worth now? Oh, I don't know, said Heinz. It would depend upon how much anyone wanted it. In the course of conversation, Heinz learned a good deal about Mr. Owen, who was a gentleman without reticence. He explained, for instance, that the redness of his nose was due entirely to dyspepsia, and not to intemperance. He was rather pathetic about it, posing as one misunderstood by the world. He entered into the question of dyspepsia generally, with more detail than seemed to Heinz to be absolutely requisite. Heinz changed the subject. "'I wonder if you'd care to come out on my car this morning?' he said. "'You and Mrs. Owen, of course. It's rather a jolly morning, and I've got nothing to do. I would be glad to drive you anywhere.' "'Not for me, thanks. I have my work to do at the cathedral. Take my wife for a drive, by all means.' "'Thanks. I will. She will be down directly.' "'Yes, I'll send her to you. She's got that bad habit of keeping away all night and sleeping in the morning.' A great mistake. I'm always telling her that. An hour later, Heinz, with Celia by his side, drove out from the cathedral city. Where shall we go to? he asked. To the world's end, she said fantastically, laughing. She was in strangely high spirits this morning. A mile further on, he stopped the car and got down to pick her the wild roses that she wanted. As he gave them to her, he said in a low voice, what is the good of pretending any more? You know perfectly well that I love you. Yes. You love me too? She bowed her head. Then you are not going back to him. You will come with me. To the world's end, she whispered. It was quite late that afternoon when she suddenly and irrevocably changed her mind. I must go back, she said. This is all very beautiful, but it's like my wild roses. It falls to pieces. There is no romance left. The sordid legal business always ends it. Besides, it's stolen happiness. I mustn't have it. I have had a day of life, and I can go on living for a while on the memory of it. You come to me too late, Maurice. It was in vain that she pleaded with her. She admitted that she didn't know whether it was conscience or cowardice, but she was none the less resolved. An hour later they were back at the hotel again. At Mr. Owen's suggestion, Morris dined at their table that night. Mr. Owen had secured a valuable addition to his collection, and was feeling pleased with himself and with the world. He rallied his wife cheerfully on her want of appetite, and said that her run in the car didn't seem to have done her much good. That's it, he continued. She has no appetite, but has a perfect digestion. I have a magnificent appetite, but I always have to pay for it afterwards. Seems ironical, doesn't it? And suddenly, Celia burst into uncontrollable, almost hysterical and quiet mirthless laughter. That laugh haunted Heinz at times for the rest of his life. End of chapter 12。Chapter 13 of Stories in Grey。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ken Davis, Derby, England. Stories in Grey by Barry Payne. Chapter 13. Locris of the Tower. 1. I am, by profession, an architect. For the last eight years I have practised in my native town at Stanoke in Gloucestershire, at first in partnership with my father, and after his retirement, alone and on my own account. The greater part of my boyhood was spent in Stanoke, and I have early recollections of the family solicitor, William Lockris. Twenty years ago, I used to see Lockris in church every Sunday morning. He sat with his wife, a rather heavy and plethoric woman, in the pew just in front of our own, accompanied by their son, a boy of my own age. Lockris cannot have been more than thirty-five then, and his hair had not yet begun to turn grey. He assisted in the collection of the offertory, and throughout the service 
maintained an air of decent interest. His son sometimes fell asleep in the sermon, and so did I. My father always did, and I think made a point of it, but Locris was always wakeful and quietly attentive. He had an office in the high street and a villa outside the town, rather an abominable modern construction called the Elms. He must have been fairly well off, for he had all of the best of the business in Stanoke, but he was not reputed to be a rich man. He was regular in his attendance at business and regular in taking walking exercise. He went away at the right time every year for his summer holiday at the seaside. If at that time, or indeed for many years afterwards, I had wished to express the quintessence of the commonplace, I should have described Locris. I believe he was a fairly good, but not a brilliant solicitor. He was honest and punctual and painstaking. He always discouraged litigation, and I owe him a debt of gratitude for having prevented my father from embarking on a very expensive and probably fruitless lawsuit. I was quite a young man when Mrs. Locris died. I remember she was buried rather sumptuously, and that Locris and his son wore deep mourning for the prescribed time. I no longer saw him in church, for I had ceased to go to church, but I often saw him on his way there carrying a prayer book in his gloved hands. He wore black kid gloves, the most rancid form of gloves that has yet been devised. On weekdays, I used to see him on his way to the office with the same loathsome gloves, but with a copy of the Times newspaper in place of the prayer book. Later, I came upon him two or three times in the course of business. I'm inclined to think the man happy, who seldom requires the services of a solicitor, and that good fortune was mine. When he had any work to do for me, I always found him able and practical, and his charges were fair enough. Five years ago, when I was nearly thirty, and Locris must have been quite fifty, he called on me one morning at my office. He gave me a commission that was quite worth having, but it was of an extraordinary nature. Looking at him, now closely, I saw something in his eyes which seemed to rather belie the dull and even tenor of his life. I accepted the commission without hesitation, because, although the work was of a kind that I had never done before, I knew where I could get good advice. I had only to run up to London and see my old father about it. 2. My father had lived, for by far the greater part of his life, in a provincial town, but he preferred London. As soon as circumstances made it reasonable for him to retire and hand over the business to me, he took a flat in German Street and went to live there. He had many friends in London and was a member of two clubs. He was glad enough to be free of routine work, but he was still interested in his profession and was always glad to help me where his greater experience was useful. We lunched together at his club and then in a retired corner of the smoking room, he asked me what the trouble was. Well, I said, I don't know that I should call it trouble. It's rather a nice little commission. But before we start on that, I'd like you to tell me all you can about old Locris. Old Locris? Oh, damn it, James, he's not so very old. He's younger than I am. I have only known him professionally. We never had any social relations. He's all right. Quite a solid man, I should say. Yes, I know that. You wouldn't call him romantic? No, not now. There was a story when he was very much younger, before he married. He wanted to marry Sir Luke Mallow's daughter. Grace, her name was. She was a pretty girl with a lot of golden hair, the kind you read about in storybooks and never see in real life. They didn't think Locris was good enough. And I suppose, from a social point of view, they were right. Though, for that matter, in spite of her beauty, it was not every man who would have married her. I wouldn't myself. The poor girl was short of one finger on her left hand. She smashed it up when she was a kid and it had to be amputated. So she chucked Locris. No, she did not. He and Sir Luke were fighting it out together, and if Sir Luke did not give way, I fancy Locris meant to run away with her. He is an obstinate chap. However, while they were disputing, Grace settled the question for them by dying, quite suddenly, diphtheria, I believe. 
there was a lot of it about at the time, and within a month, Locris was married, daughter of a poor parson and very appropriate. So it's Locris who has given you this commission, is it? Well, the money will be all right. He never spent half his income. It's quite time he had a better house. And suppose I told you Locris had gone mad. Any man may, it's possible. In his case, I should think it's extremely unlikely. Has he gone mad then? Well, he says he is not. While he was talking to me, he made his scheme seem perfectly reasonable, but if he is not mad, he is at any rate extremely eccentric. Oh, come, come, said my father impatiently. Let's have it. What is it the man wants? Locris has bought land on the east coast, not far from Aldborough. He wishes to do there what the old Duke of Portland did before him. Oh, I see. Rooms underground. Yes, one biggish room, 40 by 30, and a small anteroom communicating with it. From the anteroom is to be a flight of steps up to the surface, and the entrance is to be masked by a small tower, with two or three living rooms in it. Do you call that the project of a sane man? Well, if you wanted to do it yourself, I should certainly say you're insane, but I do not think so in the case of Locris. It's not unnatural in a man of a certain history who has come to this time of life after all there are days that one does not wish to see speaking frankly the idea has occurred to my own mind before now i have never done it i never shall do it but it is by no means without its fascination that is very much the way in which he put it in a year's time he means to retire and leave stanhope and during that year this house is to be got ready for him is the construction to be secret I asked him that. He said he should make no effort at secrecy, as such efforts always attract too much attention. He says that people will find their own explanation, that he wants an inordinately big wine cellar or something of that kind. In any case, before the tower had been built three years, people would have forgotten there is a big room below it. I gather that he has chosen rather a lonely spot where he won't be troubled by many callers. Did he tell you, in so many words, what his reason was, why he is doing this? No, but he said it was a thing which he had in his mind for very many years past, and that he was glad now to have the opportunity to carry it out. You see, he is quite alone in the world, his wife's dead and his son's away. The son, said my father meditatively, what's the boy doing? Professorship of Greek in an Australian university, I forget which. I don't know what they'll make of him out there. He was an appalling prig. Yes, said my father, I remember him. He was very, very Oxford. Well, now, it seems to me that you've got nothing to do but go ahead. Excavation's a much easier job now than it was 20 years ago. I can't go into it now because I promised to play bridge, but we will dine at my flat and spend the evening over the plans afterwards. Oh, thanks very much, Dad. That will suit me admirably. Meanwhile, I will go and have a look at the winter show at the Academy. Oh, and by the way, on that question of secrecy, he did say that he didn't want the thing talked about in Stanhope. He said it, it would be unpleasant to be bothered with questions and that clients would regard him as a lunatic and leave him and that this would have a bad effect on the value of his practice when he came to sell it. I don't think that anyone but myself knows that he means to leave Stanhope. Down in Suffolk, though, there's to be no secret about the excavation. On my way to the academy, I was greatly surprised to see Locris himself. He was coming out of a shop where they sell ecclesiastical furniture and vestments. He did not see me, but got into a cab and drove off. I wondered what he could be doing in a shop of that description, and reflected that it was quite possible that he intended to make some presentation to his parish church before leaving Stanhope. 3. During the next year I saw a good deal of Mr Locris. He liked to be consulted about the details of the work which I had in hand, and he was not an unreasonable man. That is to say, he always gave me my own way in the end. His general principle seemed to be to spend as much money as possible on the underground rooms and as little as possible on the tower, in which I presumed 
he would generally live. I did not ask him in so many words if there was any special purpose for which he needed these underground rooms. It might, of course, be an elderly man's weariness, the fact that, as my father put it, there were some days he did not wish to see, and another explanation also occurred to my mind. I went up to the Elms one night to show Locris, at his own request, the estimates I had obtained for carrying out some elaborate metal work. The servant who showed me into the drawing room told me that Mr. Locris was in the laboratory. When he came in a minute or two later, I spoke to him chaffingly about this and asked him if it was another new idea. Oh no, said Locris, every man must have a hobby. The law is a very interesting profession, but it would interest me very much less if I did nothing else. I've been a student of chemistry for many years past in my leisure time. Going to invent a new poison, I suggested. No, he said, something new, perhaps, but not a poison. Shall we get to business? In some ways, Locris was a disappointment to me. He would not fit in at all with my preconceived ideas of what a man should be like who builds himself an underground dwelling. I had to consult him about this time with reference to the renewal of the lease of my house. I wanted to get the renewal, and I did not want the rent to be put up. Locris managed it for me, showing tact and intelligence and all good business qualities in the negotiation. It was true that the law interested him. He would break off his examination of drawings of details for his new abode in order to speak again of that lease. It contained one or two unusual clauses. But at any rate, I had this other possible explanation for his actions. He was keen on chemistry and was expecting to produce some new discovery. Inventors are jealous people. He might perhaps think himself safer if his laboratory was underground. He showed himself to be a kindly man. This was particularly the case with regard to poor old Simpson, the verger at the church which Locris attended. Simpson was a man of well over 60 and incapable of doing any hard work. Rheumatism had compelled him to give up the grave digging many years before. He was an intermittent drunkard. He had long spells of total abstinence interspersed with brief bursts of intoxication. As a rule, he timed his breakdowns very carefully so that they should not attract the attention of his employers. But on one occasion, he had been found drunk in the churchyard and now been guilty of a still more horrid delinquency. He had been found incapacitated by drink in the church itself and had been promptly dismissed. Lockerus was quite angry about it. He kept on repeating that Simpson was an old man and there would be no chance of him getting any other berth and it was a shameful thing to allow one or two days when he had yielded to the temptation to counterbalance his many years of faithful and effective service. It was plausible, but it did not prevail. Lockerus moved heaven and earth to get Simpson kept on and Lockerus had a good deal of influence with the vicar, but the thing was too heinous and the old man was turned out. It was expected, of course, that as he had no one to support him, he would have to go to the workhouse. But Simpson did not go to the workhouse. He kept on his small cottage and worked in the scrapper garden which belonged to it. When questioned by the philanthropical or the curious, he maintained he had a private means. Most people guessed that Locris was allowing him a small pension. In due course, the work at Mangay near Oldborough was completed and Locris sold his practice to a couple of young solicitors who were in partnership together. It was announced that he was about to leave Stanhope, and the vicar, in one of his sermons, made a very feeling and sympathetic reference to the impending departure. Locris found himself referred to as one who has set such an excellent example, not only in the rectitude of his professional career and his private life, but also in his regular attendance at divine worship. At the same time, the vicar did not know everything about Mr. Locris. He met me in the street one day and stopped me. So sorry, he said. You are to lose your friend, Mr. Locris. He tells me he is going to live in the country. That is so, I believe. But it did not happen in his conversation with me to mention which part of the country. Oh, I said, there's no secret about it. I believe he's going to live in Suffolk. I hurried on. Suffolk is a postal address. It's perhaps somewhat vague, but I do not like curious vicars. 
If Lochris had meant to have told him everything, he would have done so himself. 4. For three years I never saw Lochris and had no news of him. For a provincial architect I was doing fairly well in my profession. I specialised in bungalows and small houses and had as much work as I could do. My father thought I should leave Stanoke and come to London and I was not altogether averse to making the plunge. But still the local connection meant a good deal to me and I did not want to lose it. Life at Stanoke went on with its customary placidity. Market day was the one day in the week when all of us seemed to be alive and Sunday was the one day in the week when we all of us seemed to be dead. On the other days we were in a condition of mild lethargy. In such a town very small things make a sensation. Sir Luke Mallow, son of the Sir Luke to whom my father referred, had an old cart horse stolen from one of his fields. We talked about it for weeks and our best policeman seemed to practically live on his bicycle but neither he nor anyone else ever found the horse of the man who had stolen it. Then old Simpson sold his few sticks of furniture to a dealer one day, paid the three weeks rent he still owed and started off into the unknown. We talked a good deal about the fate of Simpson too. There was many theories but alcohol and sudden death had their part in all of them. A week later a touring company was unwise enough to visit Stanoke and the sensation caused wiped out all recollections of Simpson. And then a man whose brother lived at Stanoke decided to build himself a bungalow at Aldborough. I knew the brother and I received the commission. I went down to Aldborough to spend some days over the business and it occurred to me that I was in the easy drive of the tower where Lochris lived. I managed to hire a dog cart of sorts and drove out there one afternoon. I left my dog cart at the one little inn in Mangay and struck across the fields on foot towards the tower. I had mentioned it at the inn that I was going to see Mr Lochris and found that any interest which might have been taken in him and his unusual dwelling had entirely subsided. Nice old gentleman, said my landlord. Wish I had his cellars. I could buy my winter coal in the summer then and save a bit. There's a fine view, they say, from that tower of his. I suppose that's what he built it for. Do you see much of him? I asked. Not to say much, the landlord admitted. Sometimes when he's out for a walk, I'll drop in here for a glass of bitter, but he's not been of late. He doesn't enjoy the best of health, they tell me. And well, well, we're none of us are so young as we were. The tower had changed very little since I last saw it. As a piece of work, I was not very proud of it. I could have made a good thing of it, but Lochris had always been very skimpy and ignoble about the tower. He would not let me have the materials I wanted. It seemed absurd, too, when he was burying good black and white marble underground. Greatly to my surprise, the door of the tower was opened to me by old Simpson. He had resumed the suit of black broadcloth with the boot lace necktie which had been official costume as verger. He must have recognised me, but he gave no sign of it. He waited there like a stone image for me to speak. I asked if Mr Lochris was in. He is, sir, said Simpson severely. Kindly wait here where you are. I'll inquire if he can see you. He returned in a moment with the announcement that Mr Lochris would be pleased to see me and he showed me into one of the small living rooms where Lochris sat writing at a cheap American desk. I noticed at once he had aged very much in these last few years. He was more bent and he seemed to have shrunken. He rose as I entered and shook hands with me. It's strange that you have come, he said. I had just written to you. He showed me a sealed letter addressed to myself, which was lying on the desk, but he did not give it to me. The fact of the case is, he said, that my son being out of England I have made you the executor of my will. It will give you very little trouble. I hope you will not refuse to act. I answered of course that I was quite willing to undertake the work and made the usual banal observation that I hoped the time was still far distant for it. I should not say that, said Lochris. I am not well. I am far from well. Dr Hannaford from Oldborough is coming up to see me tomorrow morning. However, I do not want to bore you about my health. I should perhaps tell you that by my will, I am leaving you my land here. 
Uh, you will pardon me, I said, but I don't think you should do that. I hope you will reconsider it. You have a son, you know. I believe you have not quarrelled with him. I am on perfectly good terms with my son. I have been in communication with him on this very matter. He is quite content that it should be so. You must remember that these three acres represent a very small proportion of my property, and that he will have the rest. He paused and looked at me very intently, as if he was trying to read my thoughts. Are you wondering, he said, what you will do with a house like this? He had guessed my thoughts exactly, but I told him that the idea had not occurred to me. I ask, he said, because you will not have the house. You will have the land, but not the house. I don't understand, I said. An explanation will be forthcoming. I may give it to you today, perhaps, tomorrow, perhaps, any day. If you have not received the explanation at the time of my death, it will be waiting for you in my writing. You will have the land, and you will not have the house. At this moment, Simpson brought in some very strong and bitter tea, and some untidy bread and butter. These are not things I love precisely, but I partook them of them meekly. I asked the old man if he found Simpson a useful servant. Simpson has been invaluable to me. From the domestic point of view, he is perhaps the worst servant that ever existed, but that is a matter of comparatively little importance. I am not a very particular man. Almost anything does. Nowadays, I live principally on tea, and I fancy it is not very good tea, is it? Well, since you ask me, it is a very low grade of Indian tea, and I should imagine that the continued consumption of it may have something to do with the ill health of which you complain. Really, Mr. Locris, I think you ought to get yourself looked after better. I have thought so myself, said Locris sadly. Something perhaps must be done, but in any case, I must keep Simpson because he is a faithful man and holds his tongue, you see. He goes down below with me, and he comes up with me, and he does what he is told, and no one hears anything about it. I am never bothered. I could not make out to what he was referring. I suppose I looked puzzled. Yes, said Locris, why not? Better, perhaps, on the whole. You shall have your explanation now. You shall come down with me. I consented at once. I was human enough to be rather curious as to the use to which he had put these underground rooms. He rang the bell and told Simpson to bring the lanterns. They were just ordinary candle lanterns of Japan tin. The spiral staircase which went up to the top of the tower also descended below the surface to the underground rooms. They were not very far down, the roof of them being 20 feet below the surface. We went through the iron gate and down the stairs together. Old Simpson went first with a lantern, and I followed him. Behind me came Locris with the other lantern. The aspect of the anteroom seemed to show me that my conjecture had been right. It was fitted as a laboratory, and looked as if it had been in recent use. Locris waved his hand towards the shelves and bottles. What do you know about this kind of thing? he asked. Nothing, I said. It is not my line. Is there anything very wonderful there? Yes, said Locris, pointing to a bottle which seemed to contain some brown resinous powder. That stuff in there is very wonderful. I raised my hand to take it down, to have a look at it, and found my arm struck down at once by old Simpson. Locris could see. I was angry and hastened to apologise. Sorry, he said, but Simpson was quite right. He had to do it in the interest of your safety. I don't see how my safety was concerned. It doesn't kill a man to touch a bottle. Did he think I was going to eat the stuff? No, no, said Locris. The thing is very simple. You asked me once if I was inventing a new poison. I told you I was not. It would not interest me in the least. And besides, we have plenty of old-fashioned poisons which do their work in a perfectly satisfactory manner. What I really have invented is a new explosive. There is a specimen of it in that bottle. Had you dropped that bottle, it would have been the end of all of us. Cheerful work, I said. And the big room beyond? Is that the continuation of the laboratory? Hush, said Locris impressively. It is not. The room beyond is a tomb, a chapel of the dead. 
Come, Simpson, give me the keys. We shall show this gentleman everything. I picked up one of the lanterns. We shall not need that, said Locris. The chapel is always lighted. Simpson was already pulling back the heavy sliding doors between the two rooms, and I could see the bright light beyond. Simpson and Locris entered first. Locris went down on his knees on a fold stool near the door, and Simpson, a grotesque figure, knelt on a hassock behind him. I myself stood for a moment in the doorway, astonished by the scene which I witnessed. In the middle of the underground chapel, there was erected a high catafalque, draped with gold and white. On the catafalque, there lay, in her white shroud, the body of a young girl. Her hair, astonishingly golden and profuse, was loose about her shoulders. Her hands were clasped on her breast, and as I looked at them, I saw what I expected to see. The first finger of the left hand was missing. The face in profile, as I saw it, was very beautiful, and not the yellowish, waxy look of the face of a corpse. There was a tinge of colour in the cheeks. One could almost have believed that the girl was alive. On either side of the catafalque were three brass candlesticks, eight or nine feet in height. Each of these candlesticks had seven branches, and there were thick yellow candles in them, now burning low. The candle flames lit up the red jewels in a high cross that stood behind the head of the girl. A faint scent of incense still lingered in the air. The walls of the room were draped with white and gold, and but for those things which I have mentioned, the room was empty. Locris and the old verger remained kneeling in silence for perhaps five minutes, but it seemed to me a very much longer time. Then Locris arose, and both of them stepped backwards from the room, closing the heavy door behind them. The silence was perfectly terrible. I wanted to speak in order to break the spell of it, but found nothing to say. At last came the voice of Locris, almost in a whisper. Now, do you understand? Partly, I think. Let us come upstairs again. As before, each of the two men took a lantern, and I walked between them. Upstairs in the living room, Simpson began to clear away the strong tea and the untidy bread and butter, and I waited till he had gone, and then I turned to Locris. How is this to end? I said. Quite simple, said old Locris, rubbing his thin hands together. I shall know when my time has come, and it cannot now be long delayed. I shall go down to the chapel, and old Simpson with me. It is his own wish that he should not survive me. I shall have nothing to do then, but to start in the anteroom a little piece of clockwork apparatus. It is connected with that explosive which you have seen. In a few minutes, as we are kneeling there, the crash will come. All your good work will be spoiled, my friend. The tower will fall, and the rooms below it will be buried deep. You will have your simple explanation to give. You knew that I was interested in the chemistry of explosives, and I worked on the subject in these rooms down here. You will say nothing more than this. Very well, I said. I was absolutely convinced of the man's insanity and was wondering what the best thing to be done. You see nothing unnatural in this, I hope, said Locris. That you know is the only woman whom I have loved or can love. Life would have taken me from her, but I could have prevailed over the living. Death was too strong for me. When she died, I had no other aim in life but to do what I have done here. For that purpose alone were all my years of work and all the money I made, for me there has never existed any other woman. I ventured to remind him, but you were married, Mr. Locris. Never, he said vehemently, never. The man who passes as my son is not my son. I married his mother to save her from ruin, but there was in the marriage no more than the ceremony, and she understood that there would never be any more. There were other questions which I might have asked him, but I thought it better to get away and take the necessary steps as soon as possible. I did not know, for instance, how he managed to remove the body from the vault in the churchyard at Stanoak, but the strange alliance between him and the old verger may have been at the bottom of this. The details of that removal I never did discover, but I learned that the body had been embalmed, and a doctor had told me that the method of embalmment adopted would account for that slight tinge of natural colour 
in the dead girl's face. I waited impatiently at the inn for my horse to be put in. My nerves were upset, and I left the man who was with me to do the driving. Back to the hotel, sir, he said. No. You know where Dr. Hannaford lives? Drive there, and drive there as fast as you can. About two hours later, Dr. Hannaford and three other men, of whom I was one, were driving in the direction of the tower. We got within a little more than a mile of it when we heard the roar of the catastrophe. The horse in the cart shied violently and fell. We're too late, said Dr. Hannaford, as he got down to see to the horse. End of chapter 13